All right, guys, if you don't know about this channel, you should. Nearly on Red does amazing commentary analysis on many different topics, including ReZero. This guy is the one where we were just like nutting over the uh, forbidden Oppa theory as well as the constellations. We got a video of him for the season three initial thoughts excerpt. Let's see what he's cooking up. Hi there. What follows is the ReZero segment from yesterday's Casual Monday video. And yes, it's not ReZero, it's ReZero. If you already watched that, there is nothing new for you here. But since I already have a number of videos in this series, I wanted to break it out so they could all live in a little playlist together. Here's that segment then. All right. Bro is dedicated. He got a felt Ella Liliana set up behind. This new setup is nice. I don't think I remember this background before in his previous videos, but... Hmm. Two lollies. Two lollies. If we see a vehicle around too, bro ain't beating the allegations. Let's go. Aria Zero Season 3. Especially thanks to the extra long premiere, there is a ton already to talk about in the okay. new season. We've been covering it in streams as well, so I have been immersed in a whole lot of chatter and speculations and observations. Yes. There's so much. I'm very excited to see. I, I always care about, like, I don't care about being right. I care about being able to think in different ways, to cook up in different perspectives. And I enjoy the way that this guy thinks. So like, hopefully he can help me really dissect and think about ReZero more. So that I can abandon any attempt to be exhaustive. So I'm going to talk about maybe 40% of the things I thought are particularly worth pointing out. And then the this ain't even his true power level. Rest of them in next week's Casual Monday. And then an episode at a time as they release now and in the winter continuation. Cool. The first is the new character, Liliana. I know we haven't heard much from her outside the opening, but she seems to have some vague kind of power. Mm. And there are two parts. And um, regarding Liliana, people say that Priscilla may have actually been influenced by Liliana's songs. Same as Subaru, maybe everyone else. The songstress Liliana, she has this like, I don't know, uh, impact on people. I've never seen Priscilla act that way, right? Dancing, even like um, accepting Liliana's uh, denial when joining Priscilla camp. But if you think about it, I think it aligns with what Priscilla like. Priscilla is always favorable toward the, those who kind of like confront her, those who are willing to stand up and be a little bit arrogant themselves. And Priscilla will sometimes say, oh, fun. At least you monkeys will not deliver me content. Or in Liliana's case, she actually respects it. Did Liliana's songs make Priscilla more favorable? I'm not sure. She definitely could have had an impact on those. And another thing I think is how impactful Liliana will be regarding how she will counter the authority of wrath. Authority of wrath seems to be this trance-like state where your hearts are united by one after you acknowledge Sirius. One of the scariest things is the radio broadcast tower, the meteor that we know about that Capella is using. I thought that, you know, a Sirius is going to use that stuff to kind of hold Pristilla hostage. But I think that Liliana also, if she's able to play her songs and, you know, get other people to hear and even use that broadcast tower, it may be a good way to kind of counter that authority of wrath. Parts to what we have seen so far. The first is more obvious, that she seems to have some kind of influence over people with her music. Yeah. Kiritaka is smitten with her. It's the first thing we're even told about him. But once we see the songstress in action, it appears to be more than just a case of an admiring fan. When she plays for Subaru in their first meeting... And is Kiritaka just being a lollicon? Do we need to obsess about these little details? You never know with ReZero. These subtle little things that may just seem to make sense may have a greater implication. He will join in halfway through, even able to produce lyrics and harmonize despite it to being a song newly created. We'll later see Priscilla. Prisc yeah, so how does Subaru know the lyrics here? Like, he just started rapping freestyle with Liliana. Some people are saying it's a common song that they all kind of know, but like, does this matter? Another scene in ReZero where something just happens so abruptly and we're in the heat of the moment just enjoying the song, but how the fuck did he know the lyrics? Does it matter? Harmonize despite it to being a song newly created. We'll later see Priscilla, Priscilla of all people, dancing to her tune quite literally. Mm -hmm. And when Liliana refuses Priscilla's offer to become her personal singer, Subaru and Amelia and Betty and the audience all brace for how Priscilla will react. But, but the way she reacted still aligns with her behaviors I've seen time after time, where the more that you are kind of like just folded and you're simping towards Priscilla, the more she'll see you as just like a disgusting pig. But if you kind of match her arrogance and pride, it's, it's often come out well. 
Felt and Priscilla, you know, they're always bantering. And I think like Priscilla honestly kind of enjoys that shit. And, but in this specific scenario, Priscilla was so different, right? Yes, she felt that like her reasoning was like, you know, the world is my oyster and I don't need my possessions to be around me all the time. Liliana can do her things, you know, around the world and it'll still kind of be my possession. You know, it's, it's all sound, sound like Gilgamesh, but is that extra favorability due to Liliana's song's effects? Maybe. But she doesn't lash out or denigrate or fume or anything that we'd be inclined to expect. She's gracious, even commends Liliana for her impressive faith, even tries to teach her how to wink, though with no ready success. We also see that Liliana plays for the whole town via the broadcast media, and yep. people everywhere stop and listen, pleasantly smiling along. As she's like a bard archetype in an RPG with an ability to charm. Considering how downright lousy this world is with divine blessings and protections, I am not going to be shocked to learn that she is walking around with one of them. Yeah. Now, introducing this musical magical influence in the same episode where we see Sirius's power, certainly- It's just the same, right? There is definitely a reason why Liliana's present and why Sirius's powers are just like uniting the hearts in this trance-like state. It just makes sense. Invites us to compare them, and we'll get to Sirius later. But Liliana seems to have another, more subtle thing going on. Hmm. If the music playing is charm, then this other power I would call inspiration. She seems to pull things from the Aether to come up with her near instant new songs, and they might relate to the people around her. Inspiration. Well, she is very obsessive about to know how, about Subaru's, you know, heroics. He wants, she wants to make a song, a legendary song that'll be passed down generations to etch the heroisms of Natsuki Subaru. Um, stuff like that? When Subaru first encounters her, he interrupts her by calling out the horrible lyrics, mm -hmm. but when we take a closer look at them, they could easily be about Subaru himself. Yeah, the, the lyrics were very particular. It was very depressing. No money, no future. I got nothing going for myself. Subaru says, damn, these lyrics fucking suck. I wander with no destination, no money, no future, no dreams even. All I have is my pride. Pride mentioned. I'm just a pathetic person. There's also the bit where she asks Subaru to go get them some snacks and then repeats herself refusing to move forward. And Subaru highlights this in his otaku way, comparing NPC it to line. a choose your own adventure where he can't move on without saying uh, yes. NPC line. When that exact moment ends up being the return by death reset point though, mm. suddenly we should look at her behavior a little more closely. Is there a connection here with return by death checkpoint? I don't think there's enough data points that's making a pattern of behavior to prove otherwise. The checkpoints are very meticulous. It seems to be after we've overcome some level of struggle and then a new checkpoint has been established, but there's nothing, there's nothing that Lilian that's done that made me think that a checkpoint should have been made there. Did she fix on that request out of some instinctual hunch? Did she detect whatever it is that determines the thresholds of Subaru's power? I don't imagine she understands what she's doing. It probably literally seems like creative inspiration to her, but some kind of plucking the truth uh, out of the air appears to be the pattern. Assuming so- Plucking the truth out of the air, confronting the truth somehow relates to the checkpoint being established. I don't know. I think one of the weirdest checkpoints is season one, arc two, when we showed up at the mansion and Subaru wakes up to Rem and Ram. But that's... Sorry, sorry, sorry. He wakes up in an empty room in Razal's mansion, but that's not the checkpoint. He walks to the corridor, finds Biko's hidden library, calls her a lolly, gets zapped, then he passes out. And at that point, he wakes up, then Rem and Ram are there, and then that's the checkpoint. What about that is similar to this situation? Or even after defeating the white whale and having that huddle as the checkpoint. Or even the Appa guy saying, Oi, kid, you gonna buy an apple or something? A question... I don't think this is a pattern of behavior, man. Dutch, there's one thing she says that I really want to pay attention to. Just before they go to meet Kiritaka, she will make a comment about her way and talks about weighing honor against empathy on the scales and then shattering them. Even then, we talked about the possibility of Tifun being involved in the story. 
Thank you. Another weeb referring to her as Typhoon rather than Typhon, bro. Fuck the English pronunciation. Because of that line, as judging others was her shtick and shattering them her method. But the other part I really am interested in is that weighing of honor against empathy. One of the things the premiere seems to promise is an increased focus on Julius and Reinhard and their positions as knights. Mm. Specifically, Reinhard's situation of supporting Felt, being estranged from Wilhelm, and in contention with his father, who is his superior officer. And then, similarly, Julius' conversation with Subaru, where he admits that he wanted to react in one way, but his duty demands he do otherwise. Yeah, it's like them being a knight is actually holding them back. Reinhard, you'll, er you'll only ever be a hero and that's it. And for Julius, you being such a pretty boy white knight is actually holding you back. Maybe you should just be Yuli the mercenary, man. The idea of honor, in their case, perhaps the behavior prescribed to them by being Knights of Lagunica. It's honestly a shackle. It's holding them back. Will contend with empathy, understanding how that behavior impacts or is received by others. I fully expect that they will be presented with bad outcomes that are technically expected of them against good outcomes that are what they really want. Indeed, Reinhard might already be in that situation with Heinkel's hostage taking of Felt. Maybe. We already know that he will bend if he can on a technicality, such as way back at the beginning when he admits that officially he cannot overlook what Felt and Romji have done, but unfortunately he's off duty, though he does end up taking her for a completely different reason. And so let's talk about Felt. Okay. Two things in particular. One is that it increasingly seems like she might be the kidnapped royal from 15 years prior. Absolutely. 15 years ago, Felt is definitely the kidnapped Lunican princess. And I want to believe that Romji was also like the head butler or maid or something involved in the kidnapping. He definitely knows about it in arc one to arc three, actually. Arc three, like Romji mentioned, ah, oh, Van Astra, huh? When talking about, you know, who got felt got taken towards him. He's like, eh, not bad. The one who Wilhelm tried to recover, which led to the conditions for Theresia's death yeah. and the falling out between grandfather and grandson. I wonder if there was some sort of like plan that was made such that the kidnapping happened just when the first wild white whale subjugation plan was happening to create a scenario where the sword and demon could not be with the sword saint, Teresia, and save her, right? We were talking about how could have Heinkel have planned this shit? Is he so evil that he would have orchestrated this plot to make sure that he seizes all of the Austria assets? I think that's a little bit too much of a reach. I don't think Heinkel is honestly evil. I think he's a very complex and deep character that's really down on his luck and is just a belligerent alcoholic who is just being shitty but deep inside. I don't think he is the one to craft plans like that. I still want to just blame Pandora for everything. Way back in episode 3, it seemed obvious Reinhard was trying to figure out if Felt was someone in particular yeah. after seeing the insignia respond to her touch. He Hair color, eye color, fang, how old are you, your back, your family back name, right? It all lines up to the kidnapped princess. He wants to know her age and her family name. And learning that she thinks she's 15 does not dissuade his persistence. He will say that the matter of the stolen insignia is trivial in comparison to the gravity of overlooking the crime unfolding before him. Later on, Subaru will run across Romji and catch him up on this event, and he'll muse that it just- There is a scene. It had to be in Austria, huh? Romji clearly acknowledging what's going on. And even in the side story, uh, where Felt is in a carriage with Romji and Reinhardt traveling to the rural capital or something, or maybe to the slums, Reinhardt and Romji specifically talk about the events of the kidnapping that happened 15 years ago. Just had to be in Austria. That certainly suggests that Felt is more than she appears, and that Romji knows so. Yeah. When we add all that to the story of the kidnapping that Julius tells Subaru, we even wonder if Romji was involved in the plot. Dude, I'm just, I'm, that's what I'm saying. And remember, the fan art, bro, let me, let me bring this shit up. Rom, Rem, Ram, Maid, Rezero, right? Bro, if you look at the fucking, uh, the fan art, it's not even fan art. Is it official art? Where did that picture go? All I can see is actually the fan art right now. I don't want to bring up, I, I've already done this before. I don't want to bring up, you know, the, uh, my community post where I basically posted that picture, but this is fan art. This is fan art, right? But there is an official art, I think, from Otsuka himself that had Romji wearing a maid outfit. And why would he be wearing a maid outfit? Because 
I don't know. Was he uh was he part of the was he like a slave working as like a maid or a servant for Lugunica? I don't know. Maybe. After all, he knew how to sneak into the heavily guarded throne room when he attempted to steal her out. That's another thing, actually. I never realized that. Motherfucker knew about like like how would maybe he did his research, right? I don't think like th this is a very peculiar thing though. Where he knew the secrets of the royal palace. He, there's like a hidden, uh, you know, uh, place underneath, right? Like, like, how could he have known that? Did he just do a survey casually and figured that out, you know, this day? Or does he have more ties back to 15 years ago? Who knows? ...of the royal selection. But certainly, we now understand Reinhardt's determination. The kidnapped royal and the fallout had a major impact on his family. If he has found said royal and can restore them, then I imagine he believes that much that was wrong will be put right. Hmm. I never thought about it that way. That if Reinhardt is able to restore the Luganican royalty princess that was kidnapped, then somehow his honor would be restored? Has he ever viewed himself like that? Maybe. You think that if he did that Heinkiller to prove of him? I'm not sure, but that's an interesting perspective. But not so fast, Reinhard. The other thing to mention about Felt is what she wants. While Reinhard tries and tries to turn the street kid into a princess, she is, in turn, trying to change her knight into someone who acts on what he wants. Mm -hmm. Rather and I, th I, I, it's kind of similar to, you know, Felt and Reinhard and Subaru to Julius, right? What does Subaru say to Julius, bro? He says, like, sometimes your knight in shining armor, like, persona, right? This, like, armor that you have is actually burdening you because you cannot say what's actually on your mind. Your true heart is shielded by this armor because you're always trying to be the most, like, you know, chivalrous knight possible. And that's why Subaru is able to say all these self-righteous indignation, you know, and, and lash out on other people on, you know, on behalf of, you know, Julius. But um, Julius should be more like Yuli, the mercenary that, you know, is not a knight. It's on off-duty and he can do whatever you want. And same way felt to Reinhardt, right? Reinhardt, all you gotta do is just stand proud, right? Just look stand proud and I'll figure this shit out. I think that felt influence on Reinhardt will make Reinhardt less of a fucking robot and think for himself and what he wants rather than, I guess, acts on the responsibilities of such a hero as himself than presenting as the person he believes he is supposed to be. I think Felt in this year they've spent together has got him pretty well pinned down, and this synergizes with what I said earlier about weighing honor against empathy. Even in the predicament with Heinkel holding her at sword point, I, I am unconvinced that she is actually so helpless. I mean, we- Bro, the amount of monkeys that's glazing Heinkel. You don't know! Heinkel could easily take out Felt right now! It's like, bro. I don't give a fuck if the source material says Heinkill is actually very strong. The point of the headcanon in the fan fiction is that this is a hypothetical situation that the only the author can know about. And you projecting your headcanon thinking that Felt is completely helpless, that's fucking retarded to me. Maybe you maybe I'm underestimating Heinkill or you're underestimating Felt. Nobody truly knows. But people don't understand that their opinions, the way that they write shit, it's as if they're the author themselves, and that's the most fucking annoying thing. Saw her contend with Elsa way back, and she has the divine protection of wind, wind. to boot. I won't be surprised if she is intentionally testing Reinhard by playing along. Speaking of honor. There's a kind of warrior honor ritual that- You think that maybe Felt is intentionally playing helpless hostage to provoke Reinhardt to fucking do something? To make him actually be more than just a hero? That's a precarious thought, maybe, yeah. I'd like to do that, that'd be nice. Plays out at times in the series, and one that got a little twist in the fourth episode. What I refer to is the giving of one's name. And if that's true, that Felt is intentionally playing helpless hostage, and she could have gotten out, but she chooses not to, to provoke Reinhardt to make the decisions. If this is true, holy shit, the monkey's glazing Heinkill and just playing, like, like, I don't even know why you glaze a character like Heinkill. Though, people like that truly blow my fucking mind. I guess it's towards material readers that knows the type of Heinkill person that can be. They have, like, an idealized version of him, and it has me as anime only as we cannot comprehend. But, like, imagine how stupid you look right now if this is fucking Felt's decision. For whatever reason, the Sin Archbishops introduce themselves in encounters. Whether yeah, they always say the same thing. They have an intro to Archbishop, you know, entrance. They always say the same shit. 
either by custom or because it terrorizes people, I, I'm unsure. Regulus will get downright hostile if you do not return in kind. But we also see it among warriors about to do battle. Mm. Reinhardt. Elsa the Battle Hunter. Reinhardt, yeah, for sure. Garfield, the shield, the ultimate shield to protect the Emilia's camp, stuff like that. Yeah, they always do that. Reinhardt and Elsa exchange their names before their fight. And Elsa does it again with Garfield in the second season. Yep. This past episode, though, we got a warning from Al telling Subaru specifically. Mm, do not let your name be told to gluttony right so when you're fighting gluttony skip that shit do not ever do that shit right do not tell them their name do not introduce yourself and another thing that Sirius told us as a warning when Reinhardt killed Sirius before Sirius said no no Reinhardt said any last words right and Sirius said oh you should never you should never do this to the Archbishop. They're not as like kind or like, you know, uh, uh, they, they wouldn't just like let this go or some shit. So I'm, I'm trying to still hang on to that thought and see if, you know, Reinhardt gets too cocky and too knightly and be like any last words. And that's like the end of him in a run. Specifically to not give his real name to the Archbishop of Gluttony. Since we know the eating of names is what creates a situation yep. like Rem's, I have to imagine this is why he gives such advice. But what stands out to me is that this perverts the honorable exchange of names. Their insistence on introducing themselves, and especially Regulus demanding the same in return, is setting people up for gluttony. They're yeah, maybe. Twisting something that is meant as a sh I don't know if they're intentionally doing this just to set up, you know, gluttony for a fucking alley-oop slam dunk. Maybe they are, but I have a hard time. That, that feels a bit of a reach. I think that... This is a correlation does not equal causation scenario. Who knows? It could be the case. They show a respect into a weapon. They do the same thing with love, but I suspect that may end up being a huge through line in the series. And so we'll have to give it more space at a future date. But for right now, I wanted to mention Sirius's version. Okay. I was particularly fond of how they introduced her power right at the end of that long premiere. The scene drags on and on with her just being consumed. Yeah, she is stalling. She's actually stalling for a watch time to hit that eight minute mark for the fucking mid rolls to appear. Thank you. I'm sorry. Repeat it over and over. She's always saying, I'm, I'm sorry for taking up your time. I'm sorry. Thank you. And she seems to hint. Uh, she points out at specific people and tells them, like, you guys are the most actually angry for, you know, me wasting your time, stuff like that, right? Um, that kind of hints at, like, her powers, her authority, lets her understand the emotions of others, right? And we also know that if the hearts are united, as in people recognize Sirius, right? And this is the assumption, but based on what, you know, people have been saying, and in the anime, it seems like it's not really about, like, not hearing Sirius or not seeing Sirius, even though there was, like, a, oh, took 30 seconds to get your attention or 21 seconds this time because Rachins had to flare up, but rather acknowledging her existence in your soul will suddenly make you kind of bound. And the authority, is it distance, proximity, doesn't matter. Reinhardt was fighting, was serious in the air. No one was really taking damage in the enemy. Cut contents that people were bruised up. I don't really know. But if the distance, proximity was not a thing, the range of the authority, all that needs to do is for people to hear her voice and be aware of who she is. In the radio broadcast tower, that becomes an even greater threat. Ciliatory and saying nothing of meaning and it starts to strain credibility that these people keep giving her the time of day. And at some point, the wrongness of the scene finally boils over, and we realize we're seeing some kind of power at work. Yeah. And from there, it's just wondering what in the world it's all building toward, and what a doozy it was, too. Linking everyone's fates together by making their emotions synchronize and feedback off one another. It was a deeply unpleasant hysteria to witness, and the head-splitting punctuation mark to it all was quite the introduction for our new Archbishop. A Great few more loops fill out a little more of our understanding of her power, and then we get a completely different encounter once Amelia comes on the scene. Sirius recognizes her. That's right. Now we actually see wrath as we know it. Before, I thought the wrath kind of was like madness of hysteria, but now she's mad mad. Why? Because it's looking like she is Fortuna, perhaps. The elf-like features hidden behind the mask, the pointy ear, eye color. The hair color is a bit different. Her face is bandaged up, but there's some flesh that you can see around the eyes that could kind of hint that her skin is deformed, burnt. Maybe not through fire, but through ice. Because why? Maybe it's frostbite from when Amelia froze everything, you know, 
uh, before a frozen bond happens, right? We saw that in trial two. Maybe it is Fortuna. The whole obsession with Betrugius or Conti, right? Taking, you know, his name and stuff like that. Even though the voice actors are different, I don't think that's a meta proof that this could be not Fortuna. There's constantly repeated themes of people seemingly dying, then respawning at the fucking cult, right? Fortuna being an example. Better goose, he can't really say he died. Um, Teresa von Austria with the most recent episode is definitely looking like that case too. Where it's like, oh, I thought you died, but this happened again. Um, the eight arm guy, I think his name could be Kurgan, if that truly is the person Regulus, you know, killed when uh, subjugating like a portion of Wallachia during the old days when, you know, a Metia hyping up a different witch happened, right? That could be that person. So another case of people dying and seemingly just showing up as a cult member. What the fuck is about that? And suddenly she seems like she represents wrath indeed. She gave her name as Sirius Romana Conti, mm -hmm. the same as Petaljuice, and her ire towards Amelia seems to come from a place of intense jealousy. While we can kind of figure out that her marriage to Petaljuice might only exist it, it, it seemed very one-sided. Just in her own mind, it's reason enough to want to kill the half-elf that Juice was so obsessed over. The thing I want- It's so funny how she calls out Amelia on her elf-like features. But like, look at yourself in the mirror. Bro, you have the same fucking eye color. Similar hair color. And to note is that Sirius assaults Amelia with words as well yes. as weapons. Yes, and there's distinct parallels here. Where everything Fortuna hyped up Amelia for, Sirius- shuns her for that, almost like two sides of the same coin. Insulting her features. Ironic, since it seems plain that Sirius must look similar, with the same eyes, silver hair, mm -hmm. and pointed elf ears under those bandages. But I bring it up because of how Amelia reacts. She says, my eyes, my voice, and my silver hair are all things the person I love praised. Fortuna. And further, that Sirius insulting them makes her angry. This is a change from the Amelia who used to be so self-conscious about her. Yeah, I think that this shows tremendous growth that we've seen in season two. You know, after the trials, this is a completely different Amelia. Her features. They'd earned her nothing but scorn because of the resemblance to Satila, and she used to hide herself when possible. Being praised by a loved one, though, has changed her orientation to this part of herself. We can perhaps extrapolate, then, that she has not been hiding herself or going in disguise of late. Mm -hmm. Certainly, she has not done so during the third season so far. Yeah, no more of the, you know, hiding your identity cloak that Roswell made for her. Ever since the moment that Amelia confronts her past, the present, the future, stuff like that, there's a key moment where Amelia looks in the water as she dives off a cliff. The reflections of her face reminds her that, oh, I don't really look like Fortuna that much. Oh, well, but it shows that finally Amelia sees a reflection. This is like symbolism to say she is confident and accepting herself she's embracing all these things that she was stigmatized for she even shows her reflections in the mirrors like there's like an even scene in like the early like seasons in like an ending of ReZero where Amelia is doing like a day-to-day -day life thing and she's brushing her teeth and in the reflections of the mirror Amelia tells herself Nagatsuki Tapi had to come out and fucking apologize saying this is not the intention because it was very important that Amelia could never see herself as a reflection in the mirror to herself because kind of to portray that she doesn't you know want to accept herself. There's another, uh, not just the mirror stuff, but quite often when characters are more accepting or believing of others, the person that they're talking to are shown as a reflection in their eye, right? In season one, I believe that Subaru and Amelia are talking, Subaru's pupils, the eyes, it shows a clear reflection of Amelia, but to Amelia, Subaru does not exist to kind of portray that this is one-sided. But uh, in season two, you know, after we go through the whole, you know, the kiss scene, right? Amelia eyes. Subaru is in it. And I thought that was a neat bit of implied growth on her part. Now, unfortunately, Amelia ends that episode by potentially becoming a damsel in distress when Regulus announces he's claiming her as his 79th wife. Very peculiar number. He has way more wives than that. And they many has died too. But he saved 79 specifically for Amelia. It's not that Amelia is a 79th wife, but that slot has been skipped over. Why? Ah, there's seven deadly sins. If you add the two extra melancholy and, you know, a vanity, maybe this relates to nine. It's also a prime number. Where are we going with this? I have some things I want to say about Regulus, but since I think he'll be in the fifth episode, I'm going to save them. Instead, I just want to comment on the possibility of Amelia as damsel in distress. 
Yeah, and a lot of people are saying, oh my god, I can't believe she's fucking helpless again. This is so cringe. She got so strong and she got all this development. Are you telling me she's a damsel in distress? Well, it does seem like that. But we've also seen Amelia go hard against the rat and Sirius, and you've seen the development there, not in terms of the power, but her whole like accepting of herself. And Regulus kind of showing up. It was an unfair scenario where Sirius uses Tina as bait, and Amelia couldn't do anything, and Regulus happened to save her. I don't think she's necessarily damsel in distress just yet. I hope that Amelia actually figures out the Regulus problem herself. I don't really want Subaru to like go there and like save Amelia. It's like that's my waifu and have a battle with Regulus. It'd be cool if Amelia could like handle this by herself because like goddamn, we are out of resources right now. We don't have there's so much other shit going on. There's so many things to focus on. Like Regulus is in the back of my mind. It's not a trope I love, and since she's pretty capable, I'm not sure that'll actually be how this plays out. However, it strikes me that Regulus's behavior towards Amelia might end up serving the purpose of holding a mirror up to Subaru's own. Regulus mm. has designated her as his and taken it upon himself to protect her and begin- Yeah, there's a lot of parallels with Regulus and Subaru. You could even assume that Regulus could be Subaru if Subaru was giving this amazing fucking OP power, but never corrected himself through his past failures, right? Ne if he never grew as a person, the way that Regulus even perceives Amelia saying like, it's the face that only thing that matters, right? Subaru's first thing, he simps for silver-haired girls. I mean, he has a bunch of figurines of silver-haired, like, elves and shit back at home, too. So there's a lot of the different data points that suggest that Regulus and Subaru, there's a lot of similarities. He begins making plans for their future and does all of it without a single bit of input from Amelia herself. In fact, he didn't even know her name was Amelia. Mm -hmm. I'm struck by how much that situation echoes Subaru's own at the story's beginning, yep. right down to not even learning her real name until the end of the third episode. I'm really interested to see where the next episode takes this particular thread. We'll finish this by mentioning our two newest introductions, Capella Emirata Lagunica Chansama and Chansama. Roy Alfardo, yeah. who apparently is also the Archbishop of Gluttony. Along and what does that mean if there's two Archbishops of Gluttony? Hold on to that thought, I gotta go take a piss. I am back. So, regarding Roy and the existence of multiple Sin Archbishops of Gluttony, immediately I just thought about like Demon Slayer shit, because like, a little bit of spoiler for Demon Slayer, it's not really, but in order to kill a demon in Demon Slayer, you gotta cut their head off. Like Attack on Titan, right? The nape is their weakness. But later on, there's this bullshit mechanic where there's like, you gotta kill like two people's heads off at the same time. Did I wash my hands? Why would I wash my hands? My deck's clean. You gotta cut off two people's heads at the same time, synchro, to actually kill them, right? You think that there'd be something interesting with Lai and Roy? Maybe not. Maybe there's no mechanic like that. But, what about the power, the authority of Gluttony? Is it gonna be the same for Roy as Lai? We know that witch fact, and can there be multiple witch factors of Gluttony? That's the other shit that I don't know. I thought this is like a, a unique, distinct thing. And we know that authorities, change based on what your personalities and desires and what your kind of soul represents aside from sloth because people theorize that in a meme way that sloth is so fucking lazy that it's always just invisible hands but maybe roy like like can we go with the assumption that there's multiple witch factors of gluttony therefore he has another one and then he has his own separate different powers rather than just like erasing names and memories or something else maybe or Maybe there is no multiple witch factors, but it's rather only one witch factor, and somehow, they're not even siblings either. 
they look very same, but they're not siblings based on their last name being changed. Now, maybe they have the same baby mama, but a different baby daddy. That's why their last names are different. But there's a lot of really interesting things that can be theorized with the existence of multiple archbishops. Long lie Batankatos that we had already met. Like every archbishop so far, these are all star names. Capella is a star in the Auriga constellation, the charioteer, and the star name itself means little goat. Batankatos is a star in the Cetus constellation, the whale, as something I have mentioned in a past video. He is the one who- White whale, gluttony, you know, make the connections. Who referred to the white whale as his pet. Yeah. Now that there is another gluttony archbishop kicking around, Roy Alfard, we seem to have a pattern. There are three great mob beasts, the white whale, the black serpent, and the great rabbit. <sighs> this is why I watched this guy. Now we can make this connection and assume that there are three gluttonies, you know? Oh, brilliant. Brilliant! Roy's last name is Alfard, which is a star in the Hydra constellation. And Hydra, the serpent. So there's going to be another one that represents the rabbit constellation. constellation. Ooh. If Lai maps to the white whale, Ooh. then Roy here must map to one of the other two. In Juicy. Theory, Hydra might suit the black serpent, mm -hmm. and what I would think of readily. Great the mythological rabbit. Hydra also replaced lost heads with two new ones, a replication feat that makes me think of the great rabbit as well. Yeah. What we might can assume, though, is that the presence of Roy and Lai suggests there will be a third gluttony archbishop as well. Yeah. Now, this is why I'm watching this guy's video. I told you, the way that he thinks and approaches the show, not just thinking about the story itself, but beyond the story. The constellations right now are literally hinting the third existence of gluttony brilliant. If Roy maps to the Black Serpent, then we might expect the third constellation to be Lepus, the yeah. hare, whose brightest star is named Arneb. There it is. If this is the pattern, then we might- Then the last name, Arneb. Something Arneb is gonna come. Might meet another archbishop with that as their last name. Ooh, Arneb. All right. We, whenever uh, a third gluttony is showing up in the anime, I'm going to predict Arneb as a last name, then credit nearly on red, because this is brilliant. If Roy maps to the rabbit, though, then perhaps the third constellation will be Serpents, whose brightest star is named Eunuclehe. Eunuclehe <laughs> is pretty funny. Now, I think the Hydra and the Black Serpent relation is good enough. I think that that's definitely what it's going to be. Eunuclehe, that's it. And that will be the new name. Our gluttony archbishops use first-person plural to refer to themselves. Mm, uh, that's right. That was a very particular, you know, wording. Who are you? We, right? Us. Plural. There's multiple. Plural to refer to themselves. Uh, Oretachi and Bokutachi. But what does this mean? Is this one person with multiple personalities? I don't switching know. names and attire? Is it <laughs> like, is this, is this some Blackbeard shit from One Piece? Completely off topic. I saw the stupidest fucking theory about Blackbeard and how he can have multiple double throughs. You ready for this shit? It's because he's pregnant. Anyways, could he have multiple personalities? That's three separate gluttonies. Well, I have yet to see Lai and Roy in the same room, you know? So until that happens, this is a possibility. Is it three distinct people who are linked in some way? Or are they like the white whale? There's also a separate Blackbeard meme. I don't even know why I'm talking about this. <laughs> it's just funny. Where he shows both the power of the yummy yummy fruit and the quake quake fruit. And in that anime panel, the meme is when you're shitting and jacking off at the same time or something. It's so stupid. These One Piece memes are genuinely retarded. <laughs> it's, it's not supposed to make sense. It's, it's genuinely just shit posting, bro which could create two copies of itself, but had a main body. Uh, all of these seem equally possible to me in this particular story universe. Maybe. We know Lai was able to erase people from memories, the same as the whale. If these are separate people, will their powers then mm -hmm. also mirror their respective mob beast? And what does that mean, right? Maybe this guy is going to have some deadly venom shit happening, right? We're against Roy Alfred. Alfred, you know, points to the Hydra constellation. Maybe. Coming back to our- And if that's the case, is there multiple witch factors? I don't know. Archbishop of Lust, finally. I'm amused by the picture her introduction paints, referring to herself as Lagunica Chan-sama. Yeah. Giving herself honorifics by itself is suggestive of arrogance. 
but she seemed to want both the cuteness of Chan and the reverence of Sama, and mm. so went for both. But perhaps in character, if she is actually the former royal who shares the non-star part of her name. Since the royal family of Lagunica had a contract with a dragon as their whole shtick, <laughs> actually, it's a covenant, but same shit. And indeed, finding candidates to resume that contract is the major storyline so far. It's maybe only slightly shocking to find her so, uh, dragony. Yeah. As wild as the archbishops have all been. I mean, sure, she can change into different beast types too. Maybe it's too much of an assumption, but based on her powers and based on, you know, a Capella, not Capella, uh, Carmella, Laura was about giving, you know, the ability to reproduce a fucking beast and shit. I don't know. Like, I could definitely see her transforming into a different beast and shit like that, not just a dragon. They at least have all been human form. Capella. Oh, oh another, another thing to make note of. I think, um, I think this is Annie News or Echidna that said this, but we are fixated on thinking that Capella as a humanoid, as the blonde girl that resembles Zogunikan features, is the base Capella, and that she may transform into a dragon. What about the other way around? Could it be a dragon that transforms into a humanoid? I'm not really sure. And then another, and this is probably most not likely, but you can't count out the possibility that maybe she is like talking through a dragon rather than being the dragon, which I don't think really is the case. We also see the hyper regeneration powers too. Here seems to have a human form too if it's the same person who made the first announcement. You can briefly see that she has sharp canines, mm -hmm. and so is perhaps like some of our transforming demi-humans. But I confess- Yeah, um, the canine fangs, I, 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 but there's also a very significance with like, you know, felt in the background here, where felt has a fang, red eye, blonde hair, that is direct traits of Lugunican royalty. What I'm more curious about is whatever was happening during the broadcast that caused everyone to hold their ears in pain. Um. Was that the vet? That was that was the insects, right? That was the insects doing some crazy shit. Like people are getting tortured, and I think these are insect noises. Does it have anything to do with all the weird xenomorph yeah. egg sac? Maybe. And these are the things that we saw being like like these didn't used to be here back when Garf and Mimi was at the town square. These were like human bodies dead, and then when we came back later, it turned into these things. Maybe these things are the source of the bugs. True. Heck, things all over the ground. Or is that some other horror that is the handiwork of our two atypical cultists? Mm. So many things happened all at once there, the characters didn't even get to process much about them. And Capella trundles off after a demonstration of- Trundles off. That is an amazing verb. Trundle. You know who trundle is, right? Fucking Trundle. This- Yo, this dude! Y'all know Trundle? <laughs> That's so funny. He just, I, I remember Trundle, he's a fucking troglodyte. Of her regenerative powers. In fact, she didn't actually do anything except taunt them and leave. Come, okay. come to think of it. Uh, the reason I bring it up is that we should expect her to have an authority of some kind. Mm. And we have had demonstrations of all the other ones. Yeah. Was the sound in the broadcast that authority? I think that the sound is the byproduct of the insects just swarming around and just fucking shit up, which is definitely part of our authority. What is our authority then? I mean, the trailers and opening and shit, she seems to be, you know, just like transforming partial body parts into different things. So I, I think that she just can transform. You know how Garfield can just like change a part of his like arm into big tiger hand? For Capella, I bet she can do the same thing, but with less restrictions and many different species and... Ultra high regeneration is also another aspect of it. Or is it the egg things? Or are they the same thing? We appear to be weaving quite the Gordian knot of crises through four episodes. And remember, authorities, there can be multiple powers, right? Bark bishops, they're not limited to like one single power. They can be like multiple powers, right? It's chaotic is how things feel so far. We're not even sure which things are yet set in stone, if Subaru's reset point has moved up or not. Though, I suspect that the circumstance at the end of the third episode is probably- Yeah, I think that the irreversible reverse, uh, irreversible checkpoint is when we wake up and Felix, you know, just tortures us by poking us in the leg. We fixed, if you, if you made me guess. I'm beginning to suspect that the first half of season three 
is only going to be about laying out all the complications and obstacles. For That's right. There's the attack arc, then there's the counter attack arc, which implies that the first eight episodes, we are just going to get fucked up. And then the second, uh, you know, eight episodes that's going to air in February, that's when we just hit them back. Perhaps with none of them resolved or advanced. Anyway, there's a lot more to talk about, like Garfield and Mimi and his mother, mm. Betty, Regulus. Would have loved to hear him talk about Wilhelm van Austria and the divine protection of the Grim Reaper, you know. The Austria family drama. But I didn't want this first casual Monday to be two thirds just RE0 stuff. So we'll continue to talk about all the new episodes next week as well. Casual Mondays. Huh? I, I think that he's definitely, um, uh, first of all, please go give Mr. Nearly on Red a sub. Check out his channel if you haven't. The fact that this video only has 1,322 views is very sad because I think he deserves a lot better based on, you know, the discussion and the content that he has. But let me try to theorize. I, th I think that, um... Again, I don't, I'm not going to say that I'm, I know the YouTube algorithm, but there's definitely a conflict of interest in the content that he creates and what kind of audience that he's garnered, right? He makes in-depth analysis, Made in Abyss, Promised Neverland, great. If we actually just sort by the most popular videos, you know, it's re-zero content. Not many of them, but quite a bit of it, right? And I'm sure most of his subscriber base are directly from this ReZero content. So it's really hard to, you know, push casual Mondays and talk about these different weekly series, right? There's going to be a drastic change. But if you're trying to be more horizontal variety streamer like me, right? Variety content creator where you're not just focused on ReZero, you're focused on many different shows. Unfortunately, this is the path that you must take where you have to... The views honestly aren't not going to be there. They're not. It's, it's really hard. But if you want to cover diverse topics, it's very counterintuitive for the YouTube algorithm. If you wanted to just purely get the views, I would just only do ReZero content and forget about everything else. But then the problem after that is, what happens when ReZero is over, right? And that will determine what your core community is all about. Are people watching you or your personality or are people watching you because of ReZero? That's a, that's a problem that I think a lot of people covering ReZero has to, you know, decide for themselves. But that's it for me. See you next time.